Philadelphia, Union, San Jose, or DC, Los Angeles, Galaxy, Beach Pass. Colorado Rapids, Vancouver Whitecaps, Seattle Sounders, Montreal Impact, Tosh USA, York Red Bulls. Pitch Pass, your all access credential to the people that matter in MLS. Here's your host, Greg Roach. I feel like I say this every week, but it is a huge week in MLS, which, you know, makes it more fun. It's exciting that there's so much going on with our league, isn't it? Thank you very much for downloading this episode of Pitch Pass. Make sure you tell some friends, pitchpass.com, to uh, point them in the right direction. There is usually always something going on in MLS, but this week, even bigger than most, with Don Garber's State of the League address. There's a DC United thing that I'm very excited about. And, of course, MLS Cup this Sunday. StubHub Center, Los Angeles Galaxy versus New England Revolution. We'll have the resurgent Teal Bunbury on later on to give us the Revs' point of view as they get ready to head out to Los Angeles for the match and to give us an overview view of MLS Cup plus the Don Garber State of the League and anything else that may come up in our conversation. Sports Illustrated's Grant Wall will join us right now. Grant, how are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you? Well, uh, first, Grant, ha- happy birthday. Thanks. Hey. Appreciate that. <laughs> we're recording this on a Tuesday. I'm not sure when we're going to post it this week, but it, we're recording it on Grant's birthday. And uh, we're recording it at around 8 o'clock Eastern time, which says everything you know about Grant Wall and what he does on his birthday. <laughs> That's actually a really good point. Uh, my wife is uh, out of town doing Ebola training to be ready to go to Africa in January to treat patients there. She's a doctor. Wow. Uh, so I write about sports for a living, uh, but I, I am alone <laughs> on my birthday tonight. <laughs> so what's the plan for the rest of the evening? Just kind of hang out? Uh, I'd love to say that it was a really exciting evening, but I, it's just a crazy, crazy week right now, and an exciting one, obviously, with the MLS Cup final and also the Women's World Cup draw yep. coming on Saturday in Canada. I'm going to be at both, uh, which is going to require some interesting travel situations, but um, yeah, several stories I'm working on uh, for SI.com, for, um, for SI Magazine, for, for Fox uh, when I get up to Canada, so... A lot of good stuff to talk about with soccer these days. So on your birthday, you just say, "Hey, it's my birthday. I don't want to do anything because I do everything all the other all every other day." <laughs> you know, it's one of the, the longest work days of the year, actually, if I'm being honest. But uh, that's the way December works. Uh, it's interesting. Some of the previous years I've worked on my birthday, I can remember four years ago. Today was the infamous. Qatar Russia winning the World yes. Cup hosting rights situation of was over in Zurich and um, so yeah things seem to be busy in, in the soccer world for an American sports writer in early December. Well, again, we're recording this on a Tuesday and it has been a busy day uh, as you just mentioned specifically in MLS. Uh, I, I I'm not really 100% up to speed on the Don Garber state of the league thing because as you know Grant being in DC we had a huge thing today and you know I'm not going to ask you much about the stadium specifics because I'm sure uh there you're you've got focus on some other issues but uh what would or what does this step um mean for DC and for people who may not know uh the first city council reading and vote was today for a new soccer stadium both of them passed the funding and the bill itself they have one more on December 16th, uh, which which is looking good to get a DC United Stadium finally built in the district. Well, for from a soccer perspective, it's obviously you know terrific news if DC United is able to finally get a soccer stadium built in Washington DC. I know how many years it's almost bordered on decades now yes. that people have been working on this down there, and uh, there's a, a terrific fan base that has put in so much time supporting their team over the years and, um, you know, so much tradition with D.C. United. But uh, the opportunity to have a stadium is, is wonderful. Um, you know, I'm a huge soccer fan. I'm a huge sports fan. Uh, I've never been a fan of publicly funded stadiums for billionaire owners, but from what I understand as far as uh, this deal is looking like, it, it's, uh, you know, D.C. United is putting a ton of money of its own money into the stadium. So, um, you know, as long as that's the case, yeah, I think I'm all right with it. Um, you know, I, I just, in general, I uh, think that uh, the public should be kept out of stadium deals if possible. So two two other quick points on this before we move into uh, Don Garber's State of the League. Uh, first is, 
we've seen it on the West Coast, specifically in Cascadia, with uh, Seattle and Portland and Vancouver. Um, this would be one of the first on on the East Coast of a downtown soccer specific mm-hmm. stadium. Uh, you've been to a lot of stadiums. What does a downtown stadium uh, versus one who, which is a little bit further out, or maybe on the other side of the river, if you're looking at Red Bull Arena? What, what are the what are the upsides of having this downtown arena? Well, I think location is hugely important. I think MLS is at a point in its history where it really does want to have those stadiums be in, in true urban settings. Now, you know, some of these stadiums that have been built are pretty far out of town, uh, some for better or for worse. You know, Kansas City seems to make it work not being uh, in downtown Kansas City. But, you know, you look at Dallas and, and uh, Denver and um, you know, those are a little tougher, I think. And, you know, Chicago even to an extent. And a lot of those things are built around at the same time. Uh, but clearly now when you look at where MLS is, it wants to have that downtown connection. And, you know, I was just in Houston last week where they've got a nice downtown location for their stadium. Um, you yeah, know, I think Toronto is a good location. Yeah. I think the downtown location in Seattle is probably one of the few redeeming qualities of that situation other than the fact that they, they put so many people in it. I don't think it's... You know, I don't think NFL stadiums are ideal for MLS in general. Um, you know, and, and with New England, we'll see if they can get one built. It's not easy to get uh, stadiums built in cities, as we learn from D.C. and Boston and Miami and, and even New York with NYCFC. And then the last thing is, and your colleague at Sports Illustrated, Brian Strauss, uh, made a reference to this on Twitter, and that is uh, just having a, a, a soccer-specific stadium in the nation's capital makes it a uh, uh, he didn't say home base but kind of a home base again for for soccer uh, do you foresee that happening like and I, I say that of yeah you could play USA versus Germany kind of a situation you could do that at a soccer specific stadium in the district but could do you foresee a time where there would be World Cup qualifiers there I, I still don't feel like the Central American countries would allow uh, a, a qualifier to happen in the district We'll have to wait and see how U.S. soccer handles that. I would think that there would be rewards given for, you know, building the stadium in D.C. and those types of rewards, including MLS, you know, all-star games yeah. and uh, U.S. national team games. I think we will see U.S. national team games in, in D.C. if they build a stadium there. Um, you know, it, maybe it'll be strategic ones, you know, like uh, a trend in Tobago yeah, as, exactly. as opposed to an El Salvador. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I think they would get games staged there and, um, you know, it would be a great environment with a really knowledgeable local fan base. So going, moving to Don Garber and his State of the League address, which happened earlier today on Tuesday. Um, again, I, I was kind of keeping one eye on it while I was watching city council meetings, which was fascinating and mind-numbing at the same time. Um, I, there was one thing that I saw that I kind of put an asterisk next to in the conversations, but what were you, some of your key, key takeaways from that, uh, that kind of conversation, that roundtable discussion, uh, outside of the rhetoric? I mean, we, I knew we were going to hear about how the league or the owners are, are financially poor and things like that, but I feel like that's just posing and posturing for the CBA. What are some, some real factual takeaways we can, we can go by his address? Well, not a heck of a lot of news coming out of it. Um, you know, you really do get the sense that things in Miami with that team that David Beckham wants yep. to own are really starting to come to a head. Uh, Garber mentioning again that, you know, they can't wait forever on getting a stadium deal done down in Miami, and they want to have a downtown stadium or they won't have a team. Um, you know, if they can't get a stadium in Miami, then you have a huge question of, what do you do with David Beckham? Yes. I mean, the guy wants to be an owner in your league. You would think the league wants to have him on board, but if Miami doesn't work, then what else would work? And, you know, if he decides to pull out, does the league owe David Beckham $75 million? Um, there's a lot of questions about Miami right now. And, um, you know, it, it's just been uh, a real challenge to hear Garber describe it and dealing with the politicians down there. Um you know, other than that, I mean, Garber talked a little bit about expansion again, um, you know, that he wants to have actually not just 24 teams by the end of the decade, but before the end of the decade. So um, perhaps putting some pressure on Miami, but also maybe responding to uh, the meetings that were held last week with reps from Minnesota and uh, Las Vegas and Sacramento. Um, 
you know, where there's real interest in, in having MLS teams. So um, trying to think of other stuff, you know. I, Garber seems pretty bullish on uh, on what lies ahead with, you know, new TV partners next year, uh, with Fox coming in, with, um, you know, wanting to see the league presented in a, in a good regular destination on Sundays from, I think, 5 to 9 Eastern. Yeah, and you know the thing I had asterisked was the Miami timetable, and uh, it, it was it was interesting to hear him kind of uh, kind of come out publicly and, and start n- nudging, if not shoving, uh, that process into action a little more. And I think, uh, like you said, he's uh, if I'm him, I'm emboldened by the fact that there are so many cities now that are putting their hand up with with real concrete plans for expansion and they want to MLS, which makes the, the need to be in Miami a little less um, urgent. I mean, you sure you want the glitz and glamour of Miami, but uh, I would take a passionate fan base in Sacramento over an uh, un- uncertain situation in Miami. Yeah, you would certainly think so. And yet I'm trying to actually remember here what Garver said in the public thing and, and also what he told me when I interviewed him <laughs> later in the afternoon. Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter, but I mean, I, you know, he likes Miami as a, as a site for a team. He thinks that that is a city that's not just uh, a Cuban Latino who loves baseball and not soccer anymore, that there's a lot of South American, Central American presence. Uh, the demographics have changed in Miami in recent years. He thinks it's a real influencer city. Um, with a lot of millennial, a group that he really wants to be MLS fans. And so, yeah, I think in, in Don Garber's perfect world, Miami would be a team in MLS, and, and it brings some things to the table that Sacramento or some of these other cities don't do. So before we get into the match, the the ultimate or the, the finale of the MLS season, MLS Cup, uh, Los Angeles versus New England, I do want to ask you a question about uh, Thierry Henry. Uh, he has said he's he's not coming back to MLS. Uh, been a lot of well wishes, and and I guess the question is, uh, looking at the Red Bulls the way they are now, do they need to replace him? And by replace him, I mean replace him with another glitzy marquee name, or is it more important now to just get results and not worry about what name is going to replace the name walking out the door? Well, it's a good question. I, I you know I think in in one sense that New Yorkers just want to see a winner. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think that with NYCFC coming yeah. in and the buzz surrounding them, and if, you know, if they have Lampard to start the season and David Villa, uh, that the Red Bulls need to make some sort of statement here to get some traction. I live in New York. Uh, you know, the Red Bulls don't have a ton of traction here in Manhattan, at least. Um, and so I, I, I think it would be smarter than to – to do something to to say at the start of next season that Terry Henry may be leaving and, and is gone, but you know we're still really committed to this and and committed to making a statement and, and winning games. So um, it's a big off season for the Red Bulls, I think. And yeah, we'll learn how committed Red Bulls and organization is to MLS. And it's a funky time, as you mentioned with the NYCFC thing. It'd be nice if you ha- if you could hang your hat on while they're throwing Lampard and Via at you. You could still say, "Well, we've got Thierry Henry. Uh, that's some that's a sexy name." But then you've got Mike Pecky coming out after the the loss against New England, saying, "You know what? I'm in favor of stripping this whole thing down and rebuilding for a few years," which is the absolute worst time to do this with a guy coming next door who are really just going to throw down some money to make a splash. Yeah, I like Mike Pecky, but that comment doesn't make a lot of sense to me, to be honest. And maybe he's just being realistic about where Red Bull is now and their investment in the league. But uh, if Red Bull's response to NYCFC is to cut their investment in players, uh, that sends a message to everyone in this whole metropolitan area about how seriously they're taking MLS right now. You guys kind of broke the story about the Red Bulls thing. Um Don Garber shot it down, said, I don't know where it came from. Red Bull is committed to MLS. Um, let's say, and, and we talked when when you guys broke the story, let's say that there is some truth to it and that they may be looking to get out, if not this year, then somewhere down the road. Uh, is there a, a market for that organization with that beautiful stadium uh, if someone were interested in coming into buying or if they were interested in, go, in selling it? It's a great question. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, like, I look at the New York Cosmos and kind of wonder what their aspirations are 
in the NASL when they're spending the money to sign guys like Raul and want to build an expensive stadium of their own, you know, like if Red Bull's not all that interested long term, why not yeah. sell the MLS team in that stadium to the Cosmos and have the Cosmos come into MLS? I mean, it, um, you know, the Saudi Arabian owners of, of the Cosmos have the money for all that. Uh, the question is, do they have the interest? But, you know, as long as they're in the second division, I, I don't totally understand what the Cosmos are doing as long as the rest of the teams in the NASL don't seem to have a lot of interest in spending a ton to try and compete with MLS. Um, but, you know, you never know globally who might, you know, ownership-wise be interested in buying a team in New York. Um, you know, there's a, potentially a lot of value to that in MLS. I mean, I'm sure MLS headquarters looks at it as we got a $100 million expansion fee for NYCFC, and so therefore that's the market value for it. Um, a team in MLS, but then you add the stadium value to two hundred million at least uh, for Red Bull Arena, and that's uh, yeah, it's a an pretty investment. substantial figure. Totally, uh, that'll be something interesting to to keep an eye on as we move ahead with MLS in the off season and into the years to come. Let's talk about the match on Sunday uh, at StubHub Center, Los Angeles versus New England. Um, I think, and even the Galaxy have kind of come out and said, uh, New England has been the best team in MLS over the course of the last 12 games or so. Um, to me, the concern, if I am a New England fan, is defensively and stopping the Galaxy firepower. You saw that you saw that Seattle kind of had a little bit of success, um, but is there a Chad Marshall on New England, and is... Is Shuttleworth going to stand on his head like a Stefan Fry did uh, to kind of shut them down? Well, I mean, if you asked me this question a year ago, I would have said, hey, what's it, Jose Gonzalez? He's the MLS exactly. of the year. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's a different guy in that uniform this year. And, uh, you know, we've seen him have troubles from day one this season. Uh, it's never totally gotten better, um, which certainly makes it seem as if. Um, LA might be able to to have their way a little bit with the back line for uh, New England, but um, you know, Shuttleworth has been very good, uh, especially recently, and uh, I think he'll have to have a big game uh, against LA. But you look at all the firepower that LA has, particularly Donovan and uh, and Keane. Dardis has been a little quiet lately, but um, you know they have the home field. Um, you know, Jermaine Jones, I think, has been immense yeah. uh, ever since he joined New England, and that continued in the playoffs. And he's a remarkable story to me, a guy who took a month off after the World Cup and, you know, was posting all these pictures, hanging out with Charlie Sheen <laughs> and Chuck Bedell and Paris Hilton. And, yeah, he comes back, and you're thinking, wow, this guy might struggle, and he's been tremendous. He's a total freak of nature. I mean, his motor runs and runs and runs, and that helps him late in the game. And I think other teams fear him in this league. He does so much for New England. So uh, I think if New England's going to win this game, uh, they're going to need a, a good defensive performance, but also Jermaine Jones is going to need to be big again. Yeah, and you know, I was just going to ask you about Jermaine Jones because – you know, and I was saying as we were winding down the season, uh, getting him and pulling him out of his defensive responsibilities, I, I would assume would would leave them open and and kind of exposed at the back a bit. But he just gets back, like he he'll bomb forward and get back. So I guess is it possible to pull him out of position? At this point, I'm not so sure. I mean, I used to think that when he was just you know, playing for the U.S. national yes. team, you'd see him on a your regular basis at the international level, but. You know, even other players I've talked to marvel at Jones' ability to just keep going and going um, and do that for 90 minutes. Uh, It's something that uh, I don't know how much fitness work he does, how much it's just Jermaine Jones, but (laughs) the guy is something special. And I I think he's one of the the few mid-season additions we've seen come into MLS in recent years and actually have a tremendous positive impact. I mean, most guys like Henri, Beckham, you know, a bunch of other guys yeah. have to take a while to adjust to the league, and, and Jones didn't need any time at all. Some key matchups or, or matchups that you're looking at that, that could be kind of uh, twisting in the wind or, or could could swing the balance of power in a match. Uh, from a from a 
expert opinion, talking to somebody who's just going to be watching the match as a casual fan, what are some of the matchups that we should be looking out for? Well, saw in the semifinals that Duran Jones and Cherry Henry had a lot of time kind of going mano a mano. And, and we could see that with Landon Donovan and Jones, with Donovan kind of cutting in and, and trying to have an influence uh, from the midfield position he's been playing. Uh, I think Robbie Keane against Jose Gonzalez. Uh, you know, Keane is, is the best player in the league this year, in my opinion. I think he's probably going to win the MVP this week. Um, and uh, Gonzalez needs to step up and have a big game and, and play beyond what we've seen for most of this season. Um, and, you know, you look at an amazing story. Charlie Davies yeah. has had a, a really productive playoffs and uh, scoring big goals and uh, it's, it's a, a really neat thing to see that happen. But, uh, you know, he's going to have his hands full a little bit too with, uh, with the L.A. back line. And, and you wonder whether, um, you know, Omar Gonzalez will be able to contain him all right. And, and who will he actually for L.A.? Will A.J. Delegar yeah. be available? If he is, um, you know, will he play in the center or out wide? Uh, might we see Tommy Meyer or Leonardo in the central defense? I don't think Leonardo is a very good central defender, so <laughs> he's out there in the lineup. I think that's a good sign from New England. Now, you didn't mention the, the Juninho, if he's if he's going to be marking him, uh, Lee Wynn kind of matchup. Um, he's done a great job, and I'm talking about Juninho, of kind of neutralizing whoever – needs to be neutralized in the center of, of midfield. Um, is that a matchup that is uh, just a guaranteed? Okay. Well, no, shouldn't be a guarantee, but is that a matchup that we've got our eye on? Oh, sure. Most definitely. I mean, uh, you know, you look at how Lee Wynn is, is affected games. He's so good at getting between the defensive line and, and the midfield line and finding space and unsettling defense and, uh, and scoring a lot of goals. And he's had a record this year for, Goal by a midfielder in NLS. Uh, and so, yeah, Janina becomes a, a big part of that. So does Sarvis, uh, you know. And um, now Janina's a guy who doesn't get a ton of attention, but you look at what he's done over the years. He's been an important player in some big games for LA, including from a goal scoring perspective. Yeah. You know, he does provide a, a threat from distance who can, um, you know, maybe take some attention that. Uh, defensively doesn't go toward Donovan or Keane. So you mentioned Landon Donovan and maybe the the option of him cutting inside to see if there's space left open by, by Jones' runs forward. Is he the kind of guy that would kind of relish the, all right, this is Jurgen's guy. I am not Jurgen's guy. I want to mm-hmm. stick a finger in Jurgen's eye by taking a run at, the, at his guy and, and beating him. You know... I don't think so. That's just my. It's just me talking. Yeah. I, I don't know if Donovan looks at it in those terms. He may look at it in terms of Jurgen's in the stadium and and I want to show well here in my last game and and win a title and you know go out in a blaze of glory on my terms. Uh, that might drive Donovan a little bit. Um, but I, I think in general Donovan has enough motivation with this being an opportunity to win a championship for his teammates, to go out on top on his home field uh, with his sixth MLS Cup, which nobody has ever done before. And he's got a lot of positive motivation, I think, uh, you know, more so maybe than negative motivation. So the last thing, we've seen our share of kind of dud MLS finals. This on paper, seems like it won't be that. We're not in a Houston Dynamo type of situation, uh, a yeah. team that will just kind of absorb pressure and try to do a counter. Uh, you've got a high-flying team in New England who just wants to attack, uh, playing a, a heady team with a lot of offensive pyre- firepower in Los Angeles Galaxy. Um, can we cross our fingers, hope for a, a nice, uh, beautiful game of soccer on Sunday? I don't know, beautiful is the term I would use. Entertaining <laughs> might be the term I would use. Uh, you know, I, I look at the games we've had in these playoffs, and I think it's been a, a really entertaining Agreed. postseason uh, for MLS. You know, I have my concerns about the playoff setup and how they work it out, but um, you can't argue with the fact that the games have been good, um, at least from a I'm going to see a lot of things to entertain me perspective and uh, I think that won't change this weekend you know LA is an explosive team I think New England tends to give up at least some goals 
Uh, and as a result, they're going to need to go forward as well. It's all on one game. And, um, you know, there's no questioning the commitment that these two teams have when you see their best player, Landon Donovan, Robbie Keane, Jermaine Jones, we win, you know, all just putting everything they have uh, in the winning a championship here. And, and I like playoffs in MLS. I, I, I like the stakes. I like desperation soccer. And it may not always be the most aesthetic soccer in the world, but it's almost always gripping soccer. Agreed. Although uh, I'm hoping that, again, your colleague Brian Strauss is wrong and we don't go to 12 teams next year. Uh, that's a little too much playoff soccer for me. It is, but I think he's right with the report. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll ask you. I won't ask you your prediction because the score lines themselves are, are could go either way. But um, here's what I will say: um, I think that New England wins if De La Garza is not a hundred percent. I think we saw last week against Seattle. Um, I, they get L.A. without A.J. gets a little bit nervy on defense. Yeah. Um, but I think if he plays and if he's close to 100%, uh, I find I see that uh, Los Angeles finds a way to win. But I, either way, I think we're not going to get a 1-0 match. I think we're going to get it up into the uh, twos and threes. I think you're right. Uh, and I, I think whether De La Garza can go is important. I, I think it sounds like he will be able to, from what he's saying. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I'm also holding a little bit to my preseason prediction here. I went out on land and predicted New England would win NLS Cup back in March. And uh, I almost never get these things <laughs> right, but this would be kind of an all-timer if I could. So I'm going to stick with New England. Well, Grant, happy birthday. Thank you for spending a couple of minutes of your birthday with Pitch Pass. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care. I say this every time we have somebody from Sports Illustrated on, whether it's Brian or Grant. SI is killing it with their soccer coverage. Make sure you check out all of their stuff at Planet Football. We wrapped up our conversation with Grant talking about MLS Cup. Let's continue that right now with our next guest. His golazo against... You like that? His golazo against New York Red Bulls in the first leg of the Eastern Conference Championship set New England on the road to victory. Now, as the team starts to wrap up their preparations in Boston and head to Los Angeles, we bring in Teal Bunbury to talk to us right now. Hey, Teal, how are you, man? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Greg? I'm great. Uh, you know, we had Grant Wall on just before you. It's his birthday, and he's choosing to spend his birthday night with me. This is your last night in New England before you leave for MLS Cup, and instead of hanging with your fiance, you're taking phone calls from dopey podcast come on teal yeah i mean i you know it's getting me in the mood i guess and uh, <laughs> you know it, it's fun to spend time with you i guess <laughs> did you uh is it, is it because you put a ring on it you feel like all right you know what honey we're getting married i gotta take some phone calls now now we can't go yeah. anywhere <laughs> Yeah, you know, maybe a little more leniency now. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, is is this a is this a Kansas City girl? Is this a Boston girl, or is this a hometown girl? She is a Kansas City girl. All right, and, uh, she is uh, the best thing ever for me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so a uh, city um, called Belton, okay, about twenty minutes south of Kansas City. And so, how did she take the move, or did she not move yet? Yeah, no, she's been out here with me. Um, she moved probably after a couple months of me being out here already. And, uh, you know, it's, she's still adjusting out here and, uh, it's definitely just different. You know, I grew up in Minnesota. She grew up in Kansas city, both very similar, um, you know, Midwest cities. So coming out here where it's a lot of, um, I guess, uh, a lot of urgency to get places, a hustle, lot of traffic, hustle and, and bustle to a lot bigger city, a lot of hustle and bustle. Exactly. <laughs> so it's it's just it's a change of uh, a change of pace that you know it's taking some time to adjust to, but um, it's it's growing on us now. Well, it's an interesting question because you signed up for this. You know, you, you wanted to be a soccer player. You've traveled. You Minnesota, Akron. You've you've traveled for your soccer uh, throughout the world, probably uh, Kansas City and now and now Boston. This is what you signed up for. But for for someone like her, who, this is this is all new to her. So how how do how do loved ones, I guess adjust to the the professional athlete's lifestyle yeah like you said it's uh it's an adjustment period i think for for both you know because i i most definitely want her to be happy and um you know her being from kansas city uh she went to school in arkansas for a bit and okay. then, uh, eventually graduated from mizzou so she's kind of always been you know a couple hour drive from from being home so definitely moving all the way out here where it's she's not seeing her family as much and as frequently and she has a very close family as do i but um you know she's she's very uh 
you know, very charismatic, very laid back, easy going. So it's really easy for her to, you know, meet new friends and, and to adjust to, I guess, a different kind of culture. But, uh, you know, it, it takes time like everything, but I, I think she's enjoying it and, and knows that, you know, there could always be, you know, more moves and, and that's just part of the business. So speaking of family, do you now have bragging rights in the Bunbury family with that, with that huge goal against New York? Um, I think I do. Okay. You know? I think I think I really do. <laughs> I was gonna say because like your sister can always drop the oh well I got a TV show card on you but for that for that one little week you were like well wait a second you've seen me on Sports Center I'm all over the place too now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know I'll, I'll take that you know that little week but no I mean my sister is doing an unbelievable job she's actually out in Morocco right now filming a, a wow. mini TV series called Tut that's gonna be on. Uh, Spike TV, I believe, next next summer or something like that. She's already been out there for about three months and, and is really enjoying it. Wow, wow. So do you guys swap travel stories? Yeah, yeah. You know, she, she's got a lot of stories out there. I mean, you know, you know, it's the movie or the miniseries, I guess, is, uh, you know, based off of King Tut. So there's a lot of, I guess, she's been seeing a lot of camels. She's been, you know, doing chariot rides and, uh, you know, all the sets that they create out there and meeting you know, a bunch of new people and the culture, how different it is and just how, uh, I guess, the, you know, the food, the cuisine there. So uh, a lot of, I guess, a lot of travel stories from both both of us. Well, the good thing is, and, and I'm biracial as well, uh, we, we, we can play a lot of different roles. We can, we can go a lot of different ethnicities because of the biracial aspect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's convenient. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, it, it works out. So you you have yeah. to you have to be kind of getting a little antsy. I know this is your last night in Boston before you leave. Um, how 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 badly or how much urgency do you feel to just get out in LA and start getting the routine together as we get ready for Sunday in MLS Cup? I mean, talking for myself, I'm very antsy for it. Um, it's you know all the guys I feel like we're very anxious to get out there, you know get. First off, get the nice warm weather. You know, we don't have to deal with this, you know, either 30 degrees or 50 degrees. You know, it'll be nice 60, 70 degrees out there. But just to kind of get a routine going and, uh, you know, the game's going to be earlier and just get adjusted to the the time difference and all that good stuff. But uh, for me personally, I'm definitely, definitely buzzing to get out there and and just kind of be settled in and then the big, big time show on, on Sunday. Now, I know this isn't like Super Bowl week at, or week where it's just nonstop media crunch, but uh, in the context of MLS, there is a lot more media scrutiny this week. You've got a lot more uh, media obligations than you would during a regular week during the course of the season. Uh, you've been here before. Uh, have you had any words to the guys on the team who maybe are going through this as the first time on, on ways where they can kind of keep their head on straight and kind of stay focused that this is a lot of fun and we're enjoying what we did and we're enjoying being in the spotlight but we've got a job to do as well yeah you, you said it right there you know if guys are going to ask me you know I'll, I'll probably just reiterate what you just said but uh not too many questions have come my way yet but I'm assuming when we get out there you know there might be a little bit more but it's just about you know everyone has their own specific routine and how they prepare for games and to be frank I mean it, it, this is obviously an MLS cup final so everyone's going to be a little more anxious and more excited but you have to go about it the way you've gone about all your games you know you don't want to change things up now and you know get flustered with a lot of you know maybe family members or friends you know bugging you for tickets and things like that it's you're going there to take care of business and you know we're competitive bunch and we want to win and we we have to maintain our focus Last year, you were coming back from an injury, um, never fully got reintegrated into the side. Um, you got a ring last year, but how much more exciting is this process, even not knowing whether what the outcome is going to be, uh, knowing that you are, you're playing a, a much more important role with this team than you did at the end of last year with Kansas City? Yeah, I mean, being in KC for four years was, you know, unbelievable for me, and uh, the organization there is great. But like you said, um, you know, coming back from an injury and not fully being integrated with the group and, uh, you know, now being out here with New England and uh, trying to be an integral part of this team, I feel that, you know, it's, there's definitely going to be more meaning winning this and, and for the fans and for the team, my teammates and just all the work we put in throughout the whole year. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely going to be a special moment. And then that's the goal is to go out there and, you know, and win, a, win another ring. How, uh, how, how nice are the MLS rings? I've, I've never seen one. Oh well, the the one we got from Sporting KC was is very nice. It's very nice. I mean, I, I probably won't wear it too frequently, but uh, it's it's definitely a very nice ring and um, it looks great. Okay, so why won't you wear it frequently? 
Uh, I'm not a type of person that really, um, I mean, I'm, I'm so honored to, to have, of course, it. Obviously, don't take that the wrong way, but it's just, it's just not me, I guess. Not- I, I don't really have a, many, you know, of my accolades up in my apartment or, you know, pictures or things like that. I don't, I don't really see the need for that personally. So where is it now then? Is it just in a box somewhere in a drawer? Um, that's exactly where it is. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is in its in its uh, ring container, and it's in my uh, bedside drawer. <laughs> so here's here's where I see uh, Teal busting it out at some point. So you're you're ten years retired, but you are a you are a very 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 popular. Uh, color commentator or you're the guy at the desk at for MLS today which is going to happen in 10 years after you retire and you just bust that ring okay. out to, right on the panel with everybody else you just have the ring on and everybody be like damn look at that ring <laughs> I, I could see that I guess you know that uh, a couple of people have actually said something like that where you know most people might not wear it but if they do become an analyst or something like that then then that's when they kind of you know bust it out and, and can show it off a little bit exactly and I thought maybe I, I figured you probably weren't the kind of guy that would wear the ring all the time but I thought maybe this week you would have it around the, the, the practice facility just to just so the other guys on the team know hey this is what we're playing for this thing right here on my finger uh, no, not that. I, I wouldn't want him to take it, you know, disrespectfully or anything like that. But um, like I said, everyone's really excited and, and everybody knows at this point what we're playing totally. for, you know? Totally, totally, totally. Uh, this year, kind of up and down for you. And I talked to Stefan Fry la- uh, two weeks ago of Sounders and he was coming off an injury and uh, kind of not the same injury, but the similar timeline with you. Um, and he said it kind of took him to the middle of this season to start feeling really uh, in rhythm, uh, not just 100% physically, but 100% in rhythm. Uh, did, can that kind of explain your your kind of slow start to the season this year? Yeah, I would say, you know, it, it takes time. And it's not just, um, like Stefan said, it's not just a uh, physical, um, I guess, something to overcome. But it's also mentally, you know, you have to become mentally sharp and 95 95- percent of this game is mental you know everybody at this level can play and it's just about being confident it's just about trusting yourself and uh you know being able to go out there and execute so uh, i feel like yeah it definitely took some time and adjusting to um you know a new team and a new area but um you know i, I feel like I, i've had a good season and it's um credit to just being able to go work hard and you know the training staff keeping me healthy and uh you know working with my teammates and stuff so uh, i'm feeling really good at this point now it's a business, so you expect um, the team to make business decisions. But, and I talked to Charlie Davies about this uh, over the summer, how do you stay confident when it, it felt like every acquisition the Revs were bringing in was offensive? And I don't know if it was competition for your place or competition just in, in general, but how do you stay confident when you see the club acquiring these sort of offensive tools who, who play a similar position or role that you do? You have to know what you're capable of, and uh, I, I try to uh, be realistic about my abilities and things I have to work on and things that I'm good at. So when, when new guys are coming in, you have to just know that that's that's all part of the business. You know, it's you have to go in and and I guess train maybe even harder or make sure you're staying sharp and make sure you're staying informed. So it's just you have to be confident just in yourself and your own ability and try not to get too, uh, I guess your head thinking too much yeah. about these new acquisitions that are coming in and because then that could throw you off your game. How much, and I'm not saying you did this with Jay, maybe it happened with, with Peter last year, but is there ever a situation where a player will go in after an acqu- acquisition and say to the coach, hey, okay, I-, I see you acquired this guy. I understand why. It's a business, whatever. What do I need to do, though, to continue to develop and, and stay, I guess, in the good graces of the, of the team? Does that ever happen? Yeah, I feel, I feel like I've heard players go in and do that. Um, I don't know if it's per se after an acquisition or not, but I think it's, you know, when players might not be playing as much as they think, I think it's a good time to be able to have that open communication with the manager and figure out, you know, what, what kind of things do you see me doing well, what things do you need me to work on to, uh, you know, get more minutes and things like that. So I feel that there are a lot of players that are able to go up to coaches, but there are some coaches that just aren't. I guess, approachable in that way. So you kind of just got to keep your head down and, and keep working. Now, I know Charlie isn't uh, 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 a big-headed kind of guy. When you look at him, though, and you look at everything he's been through and where he is now, 
some part of you go, oh, you know what? I can't, I can't kind of half-ass my way through practice today or, or sulk about something. Uh, look at what that guy's going through and look how he's come out on the other side. Yeah, I mean, I, I, could, I could probably tell you every player on the Revs team and probably across the league, you know, can, can see what Charlie's been through and, you know, the work that he puts in in training. And, you know, you, you might forget about it at, at times, you know, and then you kind of sit back and think, wow, you know, he, he very easily could have not been playing anymore, you know, so just to, or even, you know, walking properly and just to see how far he's come now. And, you know, me and him had a great talk a couple of days ago, just of, of exactly that, of how far he's come and how it very easily could have gone completely different than what it is now. And uh, it didn't take, you know, a few months. It took, you know, about four or five years for him to get back where he's feeling mentally sharp and physically sharp as well. Did you guys, I know you, you, you guys are close, and I'm not sure when that bond kind of form, formed, but did you guys uh, bond even closer uh, with the fact that you guys have both kind of come and emerged and come into form around the same time as kind of, I don't want to say a team, but uh, the two of you I feel like are on a similar path as far as your, your form this season? Yeah, I feel like we, we started bonding in uh, in preseason is where, you know, it took off. He was very approachable, very easy to talk to. And uh, I guess we kind of have like the same uh, sense of humor, you know, very sarcastic, like to have a good time. So it was easy for us to get along then. And I think it's just progressed uh, as time has gone on. So I wouldn't necessarily say it was just, you know, the past, you know, few months here, but it's been something that's been, I guess, growing since since preseason. Did you bond over the fact that he uh, had to ask you for rides everywhere? <laughs> that, that's, that was the craziest part, you know, getting here. He actually, um, he just had gotten his license in preseason. So he, he was he was really buzzing about that, having his license for the first time at age, I believe, 27, exactly. 28. Exactly. And uh, I had no idea about that. So I was dying <laughs> laughing when I found out. And, you know, I, OK, so you could take it the other way. If he didn't have his license, then he gets his, his license. And, you know, you've hung out with 16 year olds who just got their license They're They want to drive everywhere. So did you ever hit him up and say, you know what, uh, you like to drive. Why don't you drive me someplace? Um, not too many times, but he, he, lo- he loves driving. Uh, I'll tell you that. And he, and he fancies himself to be the best driver <laughs> in the world. Obviously, you know, he, he thinks he's just the best driver and everyone else is in the wrong. <laughs> so tell me, uh, I know you guys all hang out, which I think is part of the reason for your success is just the, the close bond that the entire team I feel like has who, uh, who, who is the best movie picker when you guys are on the road? Um, I, I would I would probably have to say Charlie. Charlie and I's tastes are are pretty pretty similar. So for me, I would say Charlie. But Ke- Kevin is very good as well. He 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 likes the I guess the superhero type movies. Yeah. So I like uh, Avengers and things like that. Okay. So He's who really who do we groan at when it's their turn to pick a movie? Who do we groan at? Um. Probably Farrell, <laughs> just because we always like to give him a hard time. <laughs> so it's not just he's got bad taste. It's just we we like to, we like to pick on him a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit, but he he could take it. He's a good sport. <laughs> okay, so what happens the next few days? Uh, just take us behind the scenes as we get ready for for match day. So Thursday, you, you're a travel day. What happens on Friday and Saturday? Yeah, so like you said, Thursday we'll get in tomorrow, um, and then Friday we'll have uh, a nice breakfast in the morning. We'll have uh, training in the afternoon, probably around the same time as kickoff will be Sunday. And uh, we will, after that, um, the session probably won't be too tough. We'll be going over set pieces. We'll be going over kind of the game plan going into face L.A., and then after that, I think we have a, uh, a nice little lunch, but then we're going out for a team dinner. And I don't know where that will be yet, but I believe a, a nice steakhouse or something like that. And then Saturday will kind of be the same routine. We'll wake up, have a nice brekkie, and then go uh, go have training around the same time as kickoff on Sunday. And um, then I believe just have a nice team dinner that night, very low-key. Yeah. I know we'll all have family in town, but uh, – 
try to you know keep our distance a little bit so we can remain focused. And then the the big the big time game on Sunday, which uh, that's what you know you play for. So everyone will be excited for that. You've, you're in an interesting situation as uh, you were a part of the the last match. Thierry Henry will have an MLS, and now you're going to be a part of the last match that Landon Donovan has in MLS. Does does that kind of stuff enter your mind uh, before matches, or will that be something you think about as as we get further away from the match? Probably a little bit further away. I mean, you know, Landon Donovan, obviously uh, a legend and has done so much for for the sport here in the States and just a a great player. Um, But I I won't be thinking about it too much, and I don't think the guys will be thinking about it too much uh, during the game. But but definitely afterwards, um, we'll we'll be able to reflect and and know that, you know, we we were able to play in, you know, Landon's last game and also uh, Cherry's. Let's say you win and the match is over. Are you running over to Landon for the jersey swap, or are you uh, you allowing someone else to to have that? Um, I probably won't be running over <laughs> there, no. But uh, I'll, I'll probably be going crazy with the the yeah. fans and family that's there, and definitely the teammates. So that probably wouldn't be my first thing. But uh, I'll probably let someone else do that. <laughs> All right, so last thing before I let you go, um, as as you're kind of reemerging and getting kind of back on the radar for the men's national team, um, I, the only question I have for you is, is, is it hard for you to travel in Canada? Um, it, I feel like it used to be uh, maybe a couple of years ago before my knee injury. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really hard to travel, but it was just, you know, at the games, it's consistently drag. being booed and, you know. <laughs> called certain things but uh you know i I've tried not to pay any attention to that and i understand you know fans are can uh, be fickle at times and uh, you know some some are more understanding than others but you know that that's how it goes in, in sports you know you have your diehard fans and you have your fans that um will do anything for the sport and if they feel you've done them wrong then you know they'll express that so and not so much anymore is the answer, I guess. Yeah, but January camp comes, you get a call in, uh, the grumblings could start again, I feel like. It, it possibly could, <laughs> and uh, and I guess we'll have to wait to see. I mean, I would love to be at, at the January camp, that's for sure. Of course, of course. Uh, well, Teal, best of luck to you. Uh, as I said with, with Grant Wall earlier, m- my prediction is if De La Garza doesn't play, you guys win. If he does play, it's going to be a battle. So that's, And I know you're not going to make a prediction. Your prediction is they're going to win. I just wanted to lay it out for you that I kind of am rooting yeah. for you to win. Even though I'm a D.C. United fan, I'm, rooting, I'm going Eastern Conference here, and I'm rooting for you guys. Okay, okay. I like to, I like to hear that. <laughs> Teal, Teal, thank you very much. Best of luck to you. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. For more show information, go to pitchpass.com.